Hello everyone, Ken here. I thought I'd mix it up today with a little reaction video to an article and a slide deck that one of my friends, Jeremy Harris, put together. Uh, I'll link his podcast episode that I've done with him so you get a little more background from him uh, below. But in this, his company, Sharpest Minds, has collected a lot of data on the, on the data science job application process. I'm going to go through some of their findings and we'll see if I agree with some of those things, if there's things that we can learn from these things. Uh, they also have quite a few recommendations on what you should do for the for the data science application process. So I think that'll be really useful to you all. A special treat, he's come in and he's been willing to talk with me about a couple of the questions that I had. So I'll sprinkle a couple of those in and I'll also focus the podcast episode this week on some of the things that we found there. So I hope you enjoy. Let's jump into this thing. So the article is called, When Should I Hear Back? And Other Painful Questions Answered with Data. So this is just some kind of intro stuff here. And uh, the first thing I really wanted to hop into was, is it rare just to hear back? And so if we're looking at this, we see that on if you're applying through a job board, it seems like there's only a 7% chance that you hear back. LinkedIn, it's almost 20%. And a cold email, it's a little over 30%. To me, this is this is really interesting. You know, if you're if you want to maximize your potential here to just hear back or create a relationship with someone, your your potential for that on LinkedIn and cold email is a lot better. Uh, to me personally, I, I've never really cold emailed anyone, um, and it's fascinating to see that this technique actually works. You know, I, I also think that all of these things make sense based on the level of effort that you have to put in. So, if we're looking at a job board, for example, that's a lot easier to apply to than making a, a LinkedIn message versus sending a cold email. Cold email is probably the hardest because you actually have to find their email and draft that message. So the next thing the article covers is uh, what are the typical response times for an application? And as you'd expect, it goes in the, inver the inverse direction where job board, it takes a lot longer. LinkedIn takes even uh, a, a little bit shorter and then the cold email is the shortest. So the next data point is something that was particularly interesting to me. Uh, we don't just want to hear back, right? That doesn't mean we're getting the interview. We actually want to get the interview. And these are the rates for getting the interview from Sharpest Minds. Um, and there's something particularly interesting here. So cold email, LinkedIn are significantly higher, but the job board is a lot closer here in this regard. And it's only 0.1% different than just hearing back. So I asked Jeremy, you know, why are we seeing that almost every single person who is hearing back is getting extended an interview opportunity. And this is what he had to say. So is it rare to hear back? So we have cold email, LinkedIn, we, we're seeing it 7% of the time we hear back from a job board. And then we go down here, hearing back is not the goal of the application. You want an interview, how do application strategies compare on that score? The job board is 6.9%. Yeah. which is only 0.1% different from just hearing back. So that to me suggests that almost 100% of the time that you hear back here, it is a uh, interview request. Is that- uh, from, from job boards, yes. So I think a oh, part wow. of this is, is as well an artifact of the way the data is collected. So we have mentees who basically use the job tracker to track their applications, but they this is another thing that um, artificially inflates the job board numbers. Like people throw out job board applications like spray and pray style, and they don't mm -hmm. always do a thorough job of logging them, but okay. they will log every single one that they get an interview for because an interview is a big deal. And once they get an interview, they can use our job search assistant to get some like some hints and help with prepping for that interview. So they have a strong incentive to log it when they get an interview, a less strong incentive to log it initially. And the LinkedIn and cold email strategies are much more helpful at the application stage. So like just to get the application out, we provide like those A-B tested templates and all kinds of things they actually use. So that data is much more complete. The job board data reflects a lot of like biasing towards just like logging the ones that actually yielded responses. So I think that's okay. a big part of the story. And so the two to 3% we're talking about in the other slide deck, that is conversion for actually landing a job, right? Or is that conversion for um, uh, getting an interview? Uh, this uh, one, sorry. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, th this is a really important point. So what I'm highlighting here 
is a median and not a mean. So okay. when you look at the job board um, application numbers that say 7%, mm -hmm. you've got some users who will get like application, uh, application interview conversion rates up on the order of like 30%. And that's usually people with PhDs or prior experience. So they see like a way disproportionate response rate. So for some people, job boards can actually work, which is actually why we include them here. So we encourage mentees to start by sending out five to 10 applications using each technique, look at the, what their response rates are, and then like zero in after they've done that exploration. Um, uh, but in the median case, you see one to 3%. So it's really like a very skewed distribution. So as you can see, the the job boards are a little bit skewed based on averages. And so if I was going to apply for one of these roles, honestly, I'd probably have a lot higher uh, interview conversion rate than most people because I have a background, I have uh, experience, I have this story that I can tell. And, um, you know, that isn't the, the normal case. It is the average, though. So when we're talking about job rates, for the most part, it makes more sense to use the median in this case, especially if you're an entry level applicant. I also want to stress that, um, you know, in the last video, I talked about the chances of you landing an interview from job boards was around two to 3%. I was referring to the median, which still holds true. The average again is closer to six or 7%, but we just expressed how this is such a skewed distribution. The next stuff is more about salaries. So if we're looking at the U S and Canada where sharpest minds operates, obviously you can tell there's a, a, a good market for these things. And there are different job positions that are in this in this use case. So we have data analysts, data engineers, ML engineers, data scientists, and research scientists. So you'd expect this distribution, this this difference. They focus a little bit on if you should ask for raise, and essentially the answer is definitively yes. So let's move on to the slide deck. The slide deck talks about some actionable things you can do to differentiate yourself to make these rates go up. Okay, let's now quickly go to the slide deck that they put together. Um, and I believe this was a, for an AI career expo. They're trying to tell people looking to get into this job market, what they should do, how they should differentiate themselves, how, how to make yourself as appealing to employers as possible. I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of the early slides. I think the gist is if you're doing the same thing as everyone else, you're probably not gonna get a job. Um, if you differentiate yourself in unique ways, that is the best way to do that. And so what does the average person do? And this might look a lot like you, right? So self-taught and they've done a boot camp, an undergrad or a master's degree. I fall into that category. I was self-taught and I did a master's degree. Uh, you know, I did one to four projects. I, when I was first applying, I did mainly apply through job boards. Although, you know, I, I applied through my university and some of those things as well. And I was really focused on outcomes. Um, now I'm assuming they're gonna talk about why this might not be a good thing. So the self-taught bootcamp undergrad masters, almost everyone falls into that category. I mean, the only one that really doesn't fall in this category is a PhD or like a software engineer, right? I was undifferentiated and I won't say no one wanted me, but I was definitely not that interesting in the market because there's so many people that were that similar to me when I was applying. Now let's keep going. I tend to agree. This is this really isn't a good brand. Um, you want to have something that's unique about yourself. For me, the unique thing was the the sports work that I've done. As I've developed my career, the content creation that I do is something that's fairly unique to me, and the type of research that I do is a little bit different. You know, if if I were looking for jobs, I would 100% lead with the YouTube content creation stuff. It shows that I can be an educator. I can teach people. I can, I can create information that way. Um, I also, I guess, have a podcast, which this which this references. But there's plenty of ways to show that you're involved in communities. Um, there's plenty of ways to show that you're involved in things that are a bit a bit more niche. A lot of people think that if they, they niche down and focus on a specific area, it's going to hurt them. But in actuality, it's it's helping you. It's giving you a really good story to tell people just because you niche in one area actually means that you can probably niche down another area relatively quickly. So that's, I think, a misconception in general. Uh, the projects are also pretty interesting. They have some data here. Almost everyone's doing Python, Pandas, SQL, Matplotlib, and SKLearn. You want to differentiate yourself. Git is an incredibly important skill. That's something I've talked about quite extensively. Working with cloud or framework or building a product is, you know, advice that I 100% agree with as well. You want to build something that does something, deploy what's the purpose of my project in my job hunt. 
Uh, I would even take that a step further and ask who the stakeholder is for any project you're doing. So I think that, you know, I myself am the main stakeholder of a lot of projects. That's okay. My YouTube community has been a stakeholder of many of my projects. Um, find an audience and build something for them and get them to use it. That That is one thing is like, if you're a data scientist, that's your job is to, to make products for people or to give advice for people. It's not just for you all the time. So if you can differentiate yourself in that front, it's going to be really valuable. So these are some hints, like you're using weird libraries, niche subject matter, you're curious about the, what the result will be. That's something that uh, my community stresses a lot is this passion for these projects. The job boards, this is a little bit of review, but um, you know we're talking about one to 3% conversion rates. And then this, again, this is median. The other article was average. So, you know, as data scientists, those are important things to us. And this means that you could have 30 to 100 apps, applications in before you get a single interview, which is pretty terrifying. You know, as a as kind of a, a data guy, I don't know if, uh, if I like those odds. Alternatives, LinkedIn, significantly better. Um, and one thing that really came out of this is talking to hiring managers, not recruiters. This is something that was completely foreign to me. Uh, I didn't realize hiring managers and recruiters were different. I probably should have. Um, but you need to find a way to get in contact with these people. You know, look at the postings, see who's hiring, try and find uh, those conversation pieces there. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you want to focus on what you're doing. Focus on the benchmark. Like if you're do getting uh, interviews at a higher rate, if you're getting interviews at 10%, at you're doing really well. It'll feel like you suck because you're only getting one in 10 but you're doing significantly better than, you know, like a standard deviation better than the average person. So that's something that I think is important to consider. Yeah. So like overall, I think that was a really, really well put together slide deck, a really good argument, something that I try to reinforce with my videos, something I talk about quite a bit. Um, it's nice that they applied some actual data to this conversation rather than me just talking about it with less quantitative findings. But it's nice to that I feel va validated. Hopefully, it's not just confirmation bias. Um, but here's a couple of questions that I had of Jeremy when I was going through this that he was able to answer. I also have a you know full about half hour long talk with him about going a lot deeper into this that I think you'll enjoy on my podcast channel. So definitely check that out. It'll drop Wednesday. So the the first question I had was kind of what was the sample size of this data? If you can allude to that, I think that um, you know I always want to make sure that this is representative of population. And if it isn't representative of the population, what are some ways that it wouldn't be? Yeah, this is an excellent question. And it's actually one that we we wrestled with in terms of deciding when to launch this, because we're aware that like when we launched this, it suddenly was thrown in the face, this data was thrown in the face of like all our mentees who are job seeking. And we didn't want them to be operating on data that's like super noisy or not representative. So the sample size we're talking about in terms of mentees is over 200 at this point. I think it's maybe 220-ish as of the time we're, we're talking. Um, but yeah, as of the date we released it, we had data for over 150 mentees. Um, what you're seeing there is the 200. And, uh, and it reflects data across, at this stage, I think it's over uh, 7,000 applications. And these are spread across job boards, LinkedIn, and cold email reach outs. Awesome. And are the mentees, I think, like categorically different from just a random person applying? You know, there's probably more coaching. There's probably more... Um, I like maybe nuance that they have less typos in their resume, <laughs> things like yeah. that. I mean, realistically, would you say that all these rates are like at least very slightly artificially high? Uh, yeah, I, I would say there's so you're right. Th this data needs to be couched in a strong your mileage may vary uh, caveat. And it, it goes along a couple of different axes. Like the first one is we screen people in based on a, a questionnaire. So we have a quiz that asks them, what have you built before and where are you at right now? So that's the baseline just for getting in. A lot of these applications actually get thrown out by, um, not thrown out, but put in, let's say, by mentees right when they join to calibrate. We encourage them to do that just so they know like, okay, what are my response rates? Where should I be focusing? Just to kind of get them in that mindset. There's nothing like making contact with the actual market to, to tell you where you need to focus. And um, yeah, and then they do get support from their mentors. They also get support from Sharpest Minds on resume and LinkedIn review. And the last thing that I think really moves the needle on this too, that's worth mentioning is the, the overall purpose of this whole system 
is to allow us to run scaled A-B tests on job application techniques. So we've been A-B testing a combination of cold email reach out copy, so the templates that people use to reach out. We have five templates that we've settled on. And the same for LinkedIn direct messaging. So we've been iterating on these basically constantly since we launched. And the whole idea is basically to, to optimize response rates and interview rates from those. So what we've seen in that process is not a massive change. So when you don't use templating, typically we see around 20 to 30% lower response rates across the board for these different strategies. So, you know, 20 to 30% boost, it's not going to revolutionize your experience. It does open a lot more opportunities for serendipity and so on, which is why we like to do it. But I think it's fair to say it's all going to be directionally accurate. Um, you know, it helps you decide certainly what strategies you should focus more on and which less. It's just a question of like, you know, relatively speaking, um, you know, how, how are you going to perform compared to like a sharpest minds mentee? And I think that is where you, you do have to do a little introspection, you know, get somebody else to help you with your, your template writing if you're maybe ESL or, or that sort of thing. Awesome. So I hope you found that informative. I thought it was pretty interesting myself. Um, I hope you join me next time and good luck on your data science journey.